Hi, this is Dr. Lloyd White, and this video continues our look at the joints of the pectoral girdle. So now let's look at the acromioclavicular joint, the AC joint, which is this joint here. Superiorly and inferiorly, we have acromioclavicular ligaments forming the joint capsule. And within the joint itself, we have another articular disc, which helps to increase the range of motion and to stabilize the joint. Now the strength and positioning of these acromioclavicular ligaments means that as the lateral end of the clavicle moves, so too does the acromion process and therefore the entirety of the scapula move with it. Now there's also another couple of ligaments which are helping to stabilize the acromioclavicular ligaments. And these are our coracoclavicular ligaments. Now how these coracoclavicular ligaments act is that when this lateral end of the clavicle moves, they're holding on to this coracoid process, and so the coracoid process, and therefore the entirety of the scapula, moves in accordance with the movements of the lateral end of the clavicle. So the clavicle and the scapula are moving as a team. So looking at the classification of the acromioclavicular joint, it's again synovial, so there is movement occurring here, and its functional shape is plane. So there's not a large degree of motion, but there's still motion in one plane. Its features include that articular disc and the reinforcement by ligaments. And the movement that occurs is the acromion process rotating against the lateral end of the clavicle. Now it's not a large degree of motion, but it's enough to help exacerbate the movements of the sternoclavicular joint so that the scapulothoracic joint moves more. An important thing to remember is that there are no muscles only crossing the acromioclavicular joint. So movements at the acromioclavicular joint are occurring due to muscles that are acting on the scapulothoracic joint. So that means that the muscles are also acting on the sternoclavicular joint. So again, when the sternoclavicular joint moves, the acromioclavicular joint also moves and creates the movement at the scapulothoracic joint. And again, just looking at the positioning of the ligaments on a diagram, we have the superior and inferior acromioclavicular ligaments reinforcing the capsule. We have the coracoclavicular ligaments connecting the lateral end of the clavicle to the coracoid process of the scapula, so the two bones move together. The conoid ligament is primarily responsible for helping to suspend the scapula so the scapula doesn't droop, while the trapezoid ligament is predominantly concerned with resisting compressive forces such as when we push against an object. And we've also got a coracoacromial ligament helping to support this joint and it's also forming a vault over the head of the humerus, which prevents the head of the humerus from dislocating superiorly. Which brings us to the first of the LMS activities for this video. So now that we know about the sternoclavicular and acromioclavicular joints and the structures that help reinforce those joints, apply your knowledge of this to assess the implications of dislocation at the acromioclavicular joint. So a common sporting injury, an AC dislocation. What structures are susceptible to damage? What will happen to the scapula? Why would that happen? And what movements of the girdle would likely be compromised by injury to the AC joint? So we've talked about the two histological joints of the pectoral girdle. Now let's look at the scapulothoracic joint and exactly what we mean by that. So it's a functional joint, so movement is occurring there, but there are no articular surfaces as such. The movements of the scapulothoracic joint are actually occurring at the sternoclavicular and acromioclavicular joints. And the reason why we talk about the scapulothoracic joint 
is just because it's a lot easier to measure the movements of the scapula against the thorax than it is to measure the movements that are occurring at the two individual histological joints. We can see them a lot better at the scapulothoracic joint. Which brings us to what movements do we have at the scapulothoracic joint. So here we have an image of the scapula moving superiorly and inferiorly. And this is elevation and depression of the scapulothoracic joint. Here with a superior view we can see the clavicle and the scapula swinging anteriorly and posteriorly. This is protraction, moving anteriorly, and retraction, moving posteriorly. And we also have upward and downward rotation of the scapula. And the purpose of these movements and the wide range of motion of all of these movements is to reposition the glenoid fossa and therefore the head of the humerus around our thorax so that we have a greater ability to manipulate objects in our environment. And we'll talk about the movements of the scapulothoracic joint and the movements of the glenohumeral joint, which is where the head of the humerus is articulating with the scapula, in a later video and how the movements of those two joints interact with each other to increase our range of motion. So now that you know all about the joints that contribute to the pectoral girdle, see if you can assess the implications of a fracture to the clavicle. If you fracture your clavicle, what will happen to your scapula? And why would this occur? When treating somebody with a fractured clavicle, how would you position their upper limb until you can get them to medical attention? And how would this positioning help? Now for further study on the joints of the pectoral girdle, you can refer to your prescribed textbook and to the principal's document as well as to your study guide. This has been Dr Lloyd White. I hope I'm making sense and thanks for taking part.